Welcome to this month's edition of Conservation Conversations. I'm Sean O'Brien, President and CEO of NatureServe. And this month, I'm really excited to have with me Dr. Kirk Johnson, who is the SANT Director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, a museum I have been to probably more times than I can count. Uh, Kirk is a paleontologist, author, curator, and of course, the leader of the museum, where he oversees the world's largest natural history collection. And I think the very first and most obvious question is, what's a natural history collection? You know, a natural history collection is basically what humans have collected over the last 300 years to understand the planet that we live on. So it includes remnants of all living things and remnants of minerals and fossils and rem remnants of human cultures. So it's you think about it, it's the physical manifestation of our knowledge of the planet we live on. So you know, you're a paleontologist, and so you look at sort of prehistory. The Natural History Museum is more, I mean, it's more recent than all history because human history that's recorded goes back thousands of years. But it's really, you're saying, much more recent history than that. Well, no, it's, we have we have the oldest rocks on the planet. I mean, we study the planet as well as the biosphere. It's the geosphere and the biosphere and and the human cultures. So, I mean, literally, our planet is the subject of this museum, and we keep the the pieces of it, whether it's the rocks or the fossils, or it's the um, pickled fish, or it's the um, skulls of blue whales, or whether it's um, cultural artifacts from different cultures, or um, dictionaries of languages from various cultures. We have you know, a whole host of things that anything you can imagine that's a physical manifestation of this planet, it's going to be in this building. And how many pieces do you have? Because I know it's a large number. At last count, it's about 148.5 million objects. So we're nearly twice as large as the next largest natural history collection in the world, which is the one in London. That's astounding. That's so much information. And what's partly exciting about that information is it's... I mean, of course, it's stored and cataloged, but it's actually actively used by people today for research and for new discoveries. And one of those uses, of course, has been by NatureServe Natural Heritage Network, where the uh, many of the specimens you have not only served as initial data that went into our system, um, but as voucher specimens for um, especially plants when we're uh, trying to analyze what we found on the ground. Yeah, and this is the thing that most people don't realize about museums. I think a lot of people have the perception that museums are large buildings full of exhibits. And they certainly are that, but that's just the front window of a museum. Museums hold these huge collections of objects as a reference for our understanding of the planet. And so we get literally over 10,000 visitors a year to research the collections. So we're more like research infrastructure in a way, because you know, a lot of people say, well, what are those collections for? What are they going to go on display? I'm like, look, we put really cool stuff on display, but that's the tip of the iceberg. And I actually did the calculation a couple of weeks ago of what percentage of our collection is on exhibit. Oh, it's and a tiny, it's such a small number. It is seven one thousandth of 1%. <laughs> With 148.5 million objects in the collection and an 11,945 on exhibit, um, what you're seeing is just the very skim on the top. And that's that's uh, it's an incredible thing because we have nearly um, a million and a half square feet of collections uh, preservation space at the main building on the National Mall and also at a series of buildings in Suitland, Maryland. And they collectively are this vault where we keep these incredible treasures about the planet. So there's so many follow-up questions. Um, you mentioned 10,000 researchers a year, which is a huge number, and it's amazing. That means that there's you know dozens of people in the building every single day doing research on our planet and the biosphere and the history of the planet, which is super exciting. And you've got this seven one thousandths of one percent of your collection on display, but people come see that. Right. So tell me about the impact that you have as sort of an educational institution. You know, I, I spent most of my career working at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science in, in Denver, Colorado. 
And in Denver, we got about a million to a million and a half visitors a year, but they were largely local. So you might say it's maybe the same 350,000 people coming three or four times a year and visiting the museum. And our goal there was to make people come back, you know, put on really cool shows and make them return. The reason I came to Washington, D.C. in 2012 was I did a little bit of math about this museum and the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History gets just shy of 5 million visitors a year. But most of those visitors are American international tourists, which means they're not coming back more than once, which means that in a decade, we've seen something like 45, 45 million unique individuals in this building, which is about 12% of the nation's population, if you think about it that way. Yeah. So you imagine a building where 12% of the nation has walked through the building voluntarily because they're interested in the natural world and humans' role in it. It's an amazing opportunity to communicate to the public. Yeah, it's not only um, voluntarily, but it's one of the great services that the government provides is that the Smithsonian's are available for free. And so anyone can go in regardless of their ability to pay because there is no fee to come in. And it is one of the most remarkable things about growing up in this area. I didn't know museums weren't free. And then I went to other cities and I was like, what do you mean I have to pay to come in? Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly. a barrier to entry. We get about 70% of our operating budget from the federal government. And that really makes it free. And I, I've had international visitors in Washington go, wow, it's amazing. You've wrapped your your government in museums. Like yeah. That's what Washington, D.C. is. The National Mall is this incredible museum complex with Smithsonian and non-Smithsonian museums. Yes. So it's an, it's an amazing asset for the world, really. And it's unique in the world. Yeah. And, you know, you were talking about a million people going to the Denver Natural History Museum and four and a half million coming to the National Museum in Washington. And I was talking earlier um, with Murphy Westwood about uh, arboretums and botanic gardens and the number of people who go and visit those and get education about the natural world. And it's really, uh, you know, we take our kids to museums or we go ourselves when we're uh, tourism. But I think we forget what we're actually getting out of that, which is this view on the world and how complicated it is and how deep and rich the natural history, as well as the cult cultural history that we get in other museums is. And uh, I just want to, I, I mean, I want to thank you for, for doing that and helping to make that available for people. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great pleasure. And it's always a challenge to figure out what the right level of information to share um, with the public is, is we get such a, a broad range of people coming to the museum, all ages, different political beliefs, different religions. And, um, you know, we want to provide an experience that's really wonderful for everybody that comes into the museum. And when you come, you'll often see family groups or school groups or, you know, multiple generation groups. It's really a, a great thing because people really want to come to the museum and they don't want to come because the world is interesting. Right. It's interesting because it's got biodiversity and it's got cultural diversity and it's got geologic diversity and it's got paleontological diversity. So it's we are kind of this uh, showcase of diversity writ large, if you want to think about it that way. And try and think of another kind of organization that does that. I mean, museums are kind of these unique treasures on the planet where we put together all the things that matter to us. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. And you know, we tend to sort of divide them out into art museums and cultural history and natural history. Um, but as you were saying that you have cultural history as well as natural history in, in your museum. Uh, and it is it is sort of an indication of what we value as a society, uh, what we put in our museums. And one of the things that's really exciting over the past 20, 30, 40 years is how that has changed at museums arboretums, botanic gardens, and zoos and aquariums to be so much more inclusive and opening, open, mm -hmm. and welcoming of um, all sorts of different people and different perspectives and, and the way that you talk about what's in your collection. You know, museums are interesting things. They really all got going as sort of a reflection of the enlightenment, this realization that you could use rational thought and observation to understand the world. And you see the big natural history museums of the world all got started and running in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So, you know, if you, if you go to many large capital cities around the world, you'll find these giant temple-like buildings 
full of dinosaurs and snakes and spiders and flowers and the whole thing. So it's it's um, this realization that we live in this amazing place and imagine a world without museums, right? There's If there was a museum, a world without museums, you wouldn't even have dinosaurs or you wouldn't have many of the things we take for granted in, in sort of our cultural milieu. And, and the fact that we preserve the original objects, the unique ones, um, has come to be incredibly valuable when you realize that every single species on the planet carries its own genome. And so this huge genomic data pool lies in these collections. And we have, um, you know, like I said, literally tens of millions of different kinds of organisms here, which means that we we basically also carry the genome of the planet. I often say that museums are the planet's memory. I mean, we are sort of this incredible data pool that people don't really even realize exists. That's so interesting. I had never thought of the 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 genetic diversity database that you that you have and we're still discovering new ways to get access to that genetic database um, from older older and older specimens. Uh, you've great. mentioned a couple times things related to species and biodiversity. Uh, one of the things that's exciting is that you all discover new species. So tell me a little bit about the new species that you discovered. Well, you know, we have a scientific staff of about 100 full-time scientists, and then we usually have a halo of another three or 400 scientists that are here on long-term visits or PhD students or postdocs. So there's a pretty vibrant scientific community, uh, community here at the museum. And when I started this job, I was kind of curious how many new species were we describing every year? And I was sitting in a room with a bunch of scientists, and I said, ask that question. And one of the women said, I think 25 or 30. And I said, that didn't sound like too many species. And he said, no, that's how many new species I described last year. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, so what's the number? So we did the count. And for the decade that I've been here, we've been averaging about 350 new species a year. So in the time I've been the director this last decade, the same decade that saw 45 million public visitors in the building, we've described almost 3,500 new species of plants, animals, insects, fossils, you name it, the full spectrum across biodiversity and from all around the world. That's incredible. And do you have a sense for how many of those are um, sort of historical or extinct versus contemporary with us? You know, I'm I, off the top of my head, I'm going to say probably about um, 10 or 15% are extinct because it includes um, fossils as well as um, animals and plants that were alive when humans started the industrial revolution. So there's a lot of recent extinction going on. I mean, we have a lot of things like parts of, like we have a, a com nearly complete skeleton of a stellar sea cow, that giant sea cow that lived in the North Pacific and went extinct in the 1790s on the expedition islands. But we also have drawers that contain um, Carolina parakeets and ivory-billed woodpeckers and thylacines from Tasmania and moas from new zealand i mean it just goes on and on we have we have the actual remnants of the animals and plants that have gone extinct while we've been around and of course of the ex ecosystems that have disappeared the lowland tropical rainforests and you know the the temperate rainforest that filled puget sound in washington state where i grew up which was old growth forest until 1850 and then bam it got buzz sawed off in about 30 years and now it's all second growth so um we record not just the history of species, but the history of places. That's so exciting. It's so great. I'm, uh, I've actually, I was at the museum a couple of weeks ago. I'm throwing your numbers off in terms of like repeat visitors. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah, a couple of, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You need to de decrease it by a few just to count, account for yeah. me. Um, but I definitely going to be uh, looking at the museum slightly differently the next time that I go. Mm -hmm. uh, the last time that I was there, actually, we were talking about, uh, you guys were hosting an event to talk about the national nature assessment. Yeah. And uh, I know that's something that you're excited about being a part of. So can you tell us what is the national nature assessment and how does that relate to things that the Biden administration is trying to push in terms of protecting the environment? It's, it's a function of the Biden administration. It was announced on April 8th of 2022, so just about 11 months ago, that we are we do a regular national climate assessment as part of the United States Global Research, uh, Global Change Research Program that comes out of the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And that's, we're now working on the fifth of those national climate assessments. And I think that many people who are in the business of natural history or climate change, et cetera, 
Um, there's a lot of focus on climate change these days, but there's also an awareness that hand in hand with climate change is biodiversity loss. And um, so, it, what, for instance, this fall at the, the COP meetings, I was at Sharm El Sheikh for the climate meetings, and then some of our teams are up in Montreal for the um, the biodiversity COP. And a, a lot of us like, you know, th these are, you know, interlinked things. The health of the biosphere is directly tied to the health of the atmosphere, which is what's driving climate. You know, plants are carbon sinks and, and all these things. So it's really hard to look at climate without looking at biodiversity. And yet we're doing a national climate assessment. We're not doing a national biodiversity assessment. So that realization is what I think drove the Biden administration to launch this national nature assessment. And it, right now it's incredibly broad in its scope. They're in the listening period. They're trying to talk to uh, various stakeholders around the country to find out what people think of nature. I mean, nature being a, a proxy word for biodiversity, effectively, but they right. consider, you know, lakes, um, water, biodiversity, ecosystems, all those things. And especially in light of the benefits they provide to Americans, whether it's um, economic benefits or public health or equity or um, climate mitigation issues or all these different things that nature does all these nature-based solutions and nature uh, you know the um the the benefits of a healthy ecosystem so an assessment like the national nature assessment has to has to create a tool to measure something on a repeated basis to see how it's changing right. and um i think what's happening now in these listening sessions is we're trying to get a handle on how do people perceive nature and um what are the ways we can measure aspects of that nature to see how it's changing over time, which is very much like what nature serve does. I mean, if you're, you're as an organization, um, the national nature assessment should be right down your alley. And I think that Absolutely. you should be really closely tied with what the government's going to be doing. And it's still very much in flux what, what it's going to actually look like over the next couple of years. Yeah, and we are uh, really excited about the nature assessment and the conservation and stewardship atlas that's being developed in the Department of the Interior for um, America the Beautiful mm -hmm. and the efforts to preserve 30% of our lands and waters by 2030 as part of this sort of global effort around that. Um, and I'm really excited that you guys are part of that because uh, I think it's it needs all hands on deck. And what you said is exactly right. We talk about climate a lot. And in some ways, it's easy to measure because we all experience weather every single day. And as we get older, we think we have a sense for what climate is, where we are. And there's very specific numbers, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, temperature that are easy to measure. But with biodiversity and nature, it can be much more complicated. You know, we don't even know how many species are on the planet. No, that's that's the thing. We sort of need a thermometer for nature. You know, it's a thermometer gives you temperature. You can read the number. It's 98 degrees. Here's the average. Here's the mean. And it's just because biodiversity is so complicated. But we've got some new tools. I mean, that's the amazing thing is we've um, you look back at how museums used to sample biodiversity and how they do it now. We used to go out and collect organisms and we still do that. We collect all sorts of different um, samples from the natural world. But with the discovery and development in the arenas of DNA, we now have this tool called environmental DNA, where we can take a, a glass of water out of the Potomac River and get the DNA out of that water and tell you which fish were swimming by. And uh, so it's an amazing tool. And we're, we're building out a program here where we're going to start collecting, um, building tools to collect environmental DNA and understand it. And if you think about it, if we take that glass of water from the Potomac, it's got a whole bunch of DNA in it, but those are just sequences of amino acids. And you'd have to sort of say, well, what does this one mean? And, and a, a typical sample might have six or 700 different kinds of things in a single glass of water, but they're all, all sequences. And you don't know what they mean unless until you tie them to an actual organism. And so if you were going to tie environmental DNA to organisms, where would you go? You'd go to a place that had all those organisms. <laughs> that place is called a natural history museum. So <laughs> what we're doing is we're working, um, and we, you know, we not, we don't just keep dried or pickled specimens. We also keep frozen um, tissues as well. So we, we've been collecting genome grade samples of the tree of life for many years with the idea of being able to calibrate environmental DNA samples. So for instance, if we were able to link actual birds, fish, nematodes, trees, 
to DNA and put the names of them on to the DNA, then we take that glass of water out of the Potomac River, we can tell you what fish by name were there and what kind of trees are dropping their pollen into the river and, and the whole sequence. And there was this amazing study published in Nature a couple of weeks ago about a two million year old site in Northern Greenland where out of the frozen soil, they're able to use eDNA to reconstruct an entire ecosystem. Oh, that's amazing. And there were like mammoths and caribou and spruce trees where today there's a thick pad of glacial ice. Right. It was all deduced by taking environmental DNA out of the soil. So that's a that's a tool we're going to see developing over the next couple of decades that will rapidly accelerate our understanding of, of the how nature is. Uh, you should think about how we used to do it. You go out and count birds or collect right. fish or, you know, the the really heavy work of like collecting and sampling and counting nature. Suddenly it's going to get a lot easier and a lot faster, I think. And that will make it much more comprehensive and we'll have better information to make decisions. We're really excited about eDNA here at NatureServe and with our partners and both water and now people are talking about pulling it out of the air so yep. you can identify birds and things like that, insects. So I think everybody and everybody listening should definitely be thinking about eDNA or environmental DNA sampling because it's going to, as you said, Kirk, it's going to change the nature of the way we assess what nature is out there. Yeah. You know, really you think about it, I've been a scientist for 40 years and just to have watched the, the advances in science and technology um, it makes me so optimistic because like we are getting much more clever about how we as urban primates um, are able to assess what's going on in the planet. And um, it's it's been great to watch these new developments come online one after another and uh, mm -hmm. give us tools we never imagined, really. I mean, museums were all founded long before we knew that DNA existed. I mean, that was only 1953, right, when DNA right. was discovered. So, um, you know, think of the depression. So these people in the 1880s started collecting things because they knew we would need this information in the future. And right. for that reason, we at the museums continue to collect things now because we know that people in the year 2100 are going to want to know what was happening in the year 2030. Right. So it's like we are, we are the forever place of our society. And, the and they're also going to have methods and techniques that we don't have will allow them to do research in the future that we're not even able to conceive of at this point. Precisely. Like people a hundred years ago couldn't have imagined DNA or eDNA even. Right. Um, so you mentioned being a scientist for 40 years. So I wanted to rewind a little bit on that in a couple of ways. So you started out as a scientist, but you've moved into this role of uh, running the museum. So tell me a little bit about that transition. And then what does it mean to, to run a museum? What do you, what do you, what do you do? <laughs> There's a couple of big questions there. I mean, I started my scientific career as a marine geologist working for the U.S. Geological Survey in Alaska, mapping the seafloor feeding habits of walruses and um, Pacific gray whales. And so I had a really nice start there. I was up in Alaska in the early 80s, just when the, um, the big satellites went up that could measure floating sea ice. So I've been watching my entire career, the demise of the uh, polar sea ice um, over time and its impact on walruses. But um, that was just my first, and that was the first job I had. And then I, I got back to my childhood love, which is the study of fossil plants, believe it or not. And I became a paleobotanist mm -hmm. and I studied um, plants. And in particular, what happened to the plants when the dinosaurs went extinct? Because we had this theory that appeared in 1980 that an asteroid strike caused the extinction of dinosaurs. And in 1980, it was perceived as a very outlandish hypothesis. It was sort of like the little green men have come and taken our dinosaurs. <laughs> and um, I, I, my timing was perfect. I was just um, finishing up college and studying fossil plants in rocks that were just slightly younger than the extinction of the dinosaurs. And I realized all I had to do is go back to the same locations, walk down the hill into the older rocks that contain dinosaurs, compare the plants before and after the extinction right. and um, see what happened at what was then called the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, the extinction horizon. And much to my amazement, um, I could see really clearly a massive extinction of plants and insects right at the horizon where the dinosaurs disappeared and right at the level where the, dino where the asteroid debris was. So, you know, it was this idea that I went out to disprove and ended up really strongly supporting 
And um, it, it's been a great thing. As I spent much of my career traveling around the world looking for other examples around the world of this particular horizon, this extinction horizon. And um, it's really, really made me think in my whole life about how I perceive the world because that asteroid impact, which happened 66.04 million years ago, happened in an instant. It was a, an asteroid that, that was 10 kilometers in diameter and it nearly snuffed out life on the planet in a, mm. you know, in a matter of days, really. It was, you know, the biggest animals that survived were raccoon-sized mammals on land. And at sea, you lost the whole, the whole um, planktonic system went down for a while. I mean, it was a tremendously devastating thing that was a global instant catastrophe. And then you fast forward to now, having that as a background in my scientific career, I look at the impact of humanity on the planet both the direct impact by like habitat destruction and, and hunting and things like that, but also just our impact on the climate and how we're driving the climate system in a different direction that it was planning to go. I mean, mm -hmm. we're headed back towards an ice age. Now we're heading back towards an ice, we're heading towards an ice free planet. And, uh, and to see that happen in the span of my life, because, you know, the, the we've watched CO2, all of us have, who are baby boomers have watched CO2 climb from around 300 parts per million when we were kids to 420 parts per million today. There's a 33% increase in a global gas in the time it took to grow you and me. So, <laughs> I mean, we're living in this time of incredibly rapid change. It wasn't as rapid as the asteroid, but 200 years is fast when you think about the age of the planet. And right. That's where we are. And so that's actually, I'm glad you circled around to that um the idea because we hear people talking about it and we talk about the sixth extinction and this being sort of the sixth time in the history of the earth that we're seeing extinction rates that are far exceed sort of the natural background rate that just happens with ordinary variation um what are your thoughts on this term the sixth extinction and how how impactful this is going to be when people look back let's say a million years from now at the at the fossil record well, you know, the fossil record is quite imperfect because it really only records the records of organisms that were living um, below baseline. And by that, I mean that animals and plants that live in areas that are going to get buried. So, um, you know, things that live in the ocean get buried because they're at the bottom of the sea. Things that live near lakes get buried because they fall into lakes. Um, but most terrestrial ecosystems are living in the uplands and those areas are eroding away and they're never going to get fossilized. So in a first in a first order approximation, the fossil record tells you a lot about life in the oceans and in low swampy areas and very little about things that live on mountains and high eroding areas. So right out of the gate, you're missing sort of half the picture. Uh, and when that means that when you see a mass extinction in the fossil record, you're seeing um, a major extinction of species that records organisms that are living in the ocean or living in the swampy lowlands of continents. Um, and often you see these extinctions, they go right down to the deepest bottom of the sea. So these ancient extinctions really are recording big events. So there is some debate whether or not we're in the sixth to sixth year or not. We are definitely in an area of very extremely increased extinction, but whether it's like mounts as the sixth big one or not, is sort of a matter of choice. And that's kind of the, the incredible thing about our present moment in time is that we have, as a species, have become really smart and we're very collaborative and we can do things like change the composition of the atmosphere, which means that we can also make choices to not do those things, mm -hmm. right? And that's, I think that's the most compelling thing about our present moment is that we're nosing into climate change. We're nosing into biodiversity loss. If we continue on our present trajectory, we will see the sixth extinction, but we don't have to. I mean, that's actually quite literally a human choice. Yeah, the ozone hole um, is a great example of where we got together and we realized we were making this fundamental change to the planet and actually reversed it, which yeah. I, when I first heard about the ozone hole and what it was going to take to fix it, never really thought that we would pull it off. And I'm sort of very happy that we've, we've managed to that. Um, so you've, we've talked a lot about science, which is really fun because I'm a scientist too, but I don't, uh, I sort of play one on TV at this point. Um, but you uh, have continued to do some things that are uh, publication worthy. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about your paper that's coming out soon. So, you know, I've been working for a long time and I, as a museum director, most of my time is not doing science. It's, it's supervising science it's supporting science, but it's also taking care of the national collection. It's also welcoming our millions of visitors. It's negotiating the politics of being part of the Smithsonian and part of the U S government and um, the opportunities that come with that and the challenges that come with that. You know, so my, you asked about my the typical day as a museum director and there is no typical day. Every day <laughs> is a, uh, Various flavors of firefighting and huge opportunities and amazing guests and incredible opportunities. It's a it's super exciting um, job. But the um, so one of the things that, that I've come to realize as I've grown more and more enamored through the course of my life with natural history museums is they all operate in isolation. They, like there's a there's one here, there's one in New York, there's one in Chicago. You know, there's it happen to be big buildings in big cities long ways from each other. They don't really compete with each other. They all are sort of living out the life of being a big museum in a city. And, and I grew interested in this concept of what is the global natural history museum? Because at the end of the day, there's probably about 150 or 200 big natural history museums in the world. They all got started about more or less the same time for more or less the same reason. People were worried about what humans are doing to the planet. And they built these museums and it occurred to me that the time we're in right now it really demands extraordinary efforts. And it occurs to me that museums could be way more effective if they work together, if they created a network, a global network of museums that collaborated on all aspects, collaborated on the collections, collaborated on their science, collaborated on their public communication. And of course, we have so many new tools that allow that sort of collaboration to happen smoothly. You know, we can have these. You know, I, I could imagine a time actually right now where an expert in any museum could be an expert in every museum just because of the power of Zoom. Like it used right. to be we have our 100 experts here and London's got their 100 experts over there. Well, now there nothing stops us from combining our expertise. And so we um, started meeting with other museum directors from around the world and quickly realized when talking to them that we all felt that our number one asset was the collections we held on behalf of the population of the world. And so we started thinking, could we actually, do we even know what that world collection looks like? What's the global collection? I can tell you about my collection. Yeah. What does the global collection look like? And we 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 realized pretty quickly we couldn't because our collections date way back. We've only started digitizing them quite recently. So none of the collections are completely digitized. It'd be nice to have them digitized and imaged, but that's, you know, it, it would be, I think our museum is about, um, 20% digitized, for instance. So um, that means that 80% of my collection is effectively dark data. And that's correct for all the other museums in the world, too. So if you want to use museums, the collaboration of museums as a solution for or a partial solution for the challenges of the 21st century, you have to activate them and be able to link them together. So we started talking about ways that we might... Um, accelerate a collaboration in museums. And we realized that we could create some pretty simple tools to compare our collections in advance of them being fully digitized. And we so we, we've been working on that now. And that's what I'm, I'm working for this, this paper that will hopefully come out soon that will, um, will basically show the results of our assessment of 73 of the world's largest museums. We started with 10, we went to 73. And the 73 hold about 1.1 billion objects. Um, and we've managed to break them down into 19 categories that we all understand and map them onto 16 geographic um, regions that cover the entire globe. So this grid of 19 collection types by 16 uh, geographic regions gives me a grid of 304 cells. Right. And if you wanted to think about the planet, you imagine you'd probably want to have each one of those cells filled to understand the planet. And so we basically created a heat map that allows us to look at how well we've done collecting the world for the last 300 years Mm -hmm. um, using the 73 of the world's largest museums as a proxy for the whole global collection. And I think, I do think that the 73 museums probably has about half of the world's collection. Right. Um, because right. there aren't that many museums. Right. So it's like 
it's actually a pretty solvable problem if you make the collection data collection simple enough that you can approach the problem from the top down and say, let's look at the, these broad categories. Where are the strengths? Where are the weaknesses? And then that identifies gaps, areas that we haven't collected. Um, but one other thing that's really interesting is we, since we have collections from two or 300 years ago, we actually have the remnants of ecosystems that are no longer exist as well, not just objects. And if you throw fossils into that, you have the whole narrative of the planet. So we have this, this data set that is profoundly useful as you think about how the world's going to change in the future. Because if we warm, let's say we warm a couple of degrees, we can go back to a time when we were that warm in the past and say, well, here's what the distribution of plants look like. So we give, right. we can future cast using fossils. Um, and the more data we have, the better. So right now it's a, it's a race to make our information accessible and usable. That sounds, it's really exciting. And I love this idea of this three-dimensional heat map that actually has a fourth dimension of history of time uh, that makes it even more complicated. But the idea that you can use that to prioritize where future collection might be done because it's going to be more valuable in understanding the planet is really exciting. And so that's a really cool thing. This is going to be a paper published in the journal Science coming up. Currently, it's in the future, but perhaps when people are listening, it will be in the past that it has been out. So hopefully people will look for that. Um, so uh, one of the things I like to do on the show is I end up talking to a lot of people who say things like, yeah, when I was a kid, I was really into fossil plants. And uh, I think to myself, you know, as a parent, if your kid says, yeah, you know, I really want to study fossil plants for my career. A lot of parents are like, whoa, let's maybe find something where you can get a job. Yeah. Um, and you've made an amazing career out of a childhood passion um, in fossil plants. And I'm a little bit curious how you got interested in fossil plants as a child. And then just sort of Think about like this career opportunities that sort of seem hidden. Like we all go to the museums, but we forget that there's a hundred scientists behind the museum. And then there's all the people who work in the museum and the training and the passion that they've had. So I'm, I'm a little curious about your, your path there. Well, I can tell you, I'll say before I start that I, um, I've been interviewing scientists for a couple of decades now, because I'm, I'm, I'm curious about the same thing. What makes a scientist? And I found that there are six or seven themes that run through why people become scientists. And a lot of them have to do with um, early experiences outdoors as a child. Um, others have to do with really supportive parents or um, really great teachers or mentors or media experiences like Jurassic Park made a lot of paleontologists, for instance, or, you know, National Geographic uh, and those kinds of things, those or or no one was a um, if you made a discovery when you were a young person by if you accidentally found something that was important, um, you know, yeah. whatever it would be, um, all those things kind of spur you on. And I think for me, I, I grew up in Seattle and uh, my mom was from Wyoming. My dad was from California. So we would drive every summer to either Wyoming or California. So I got to see a lot of the American West and we'd stop and get out and hunt around and find things. And I would find fossils and arrowheads and stuff. And I, as a little kid, I became really good at finding things. And I would say, because mm -hmm. kids find things that are closer to the ground, but they're, they're they're all looking around. And I that became my childhood superpower was I was a finder of stuff. And I so as a result, I walk down the street, I'll find money in the street because I'm always scanning for things wherever <laughs> I go. And um, that superpower became good. And then I met um, I met a guy when I was about thirteen who was a um, autograph collector so he would write famous people for their autographs mm -hmm. and they would write him back and then he would write them back and so when i met him he was in correspondence with a whole bunch of famous people and he wasn't really a famous guy he was just corresponding with famous people because he realized that if you reach out to people they'll reach back right and he said you should reach out to scientists you're 13 years old start writing to scientists so i did um and you know i just became a scientist by the time i was in college i was already a scientist I had made discoveries that people had published on because I was corresponding. So for me, it was sort of a seamless thing. And I learned early on that the really cool stuff was in museums. So I found my way to museums. And so by the time I was in college, I was a museum scientist. And, and I was super passionate about what I did. And passion drives it all. I mean, if you're really right. excited about what you're doing, 
you're forever reading things, you're meeting people and opportunities emerge in, in scores. So I think it really is that, you know, being, having a passion is so critical. And mine was about finding things in the natural world. And that's just an endless opportunity. Yeah. I'm, that's a really great story. I love that. And the, um, the idea that <laughs> you're finding money is, I just find it's kind of funny, but um, the, the, the themes that you described, um, certainly uh, f- four or five of those six or seven are part of my history um, supported parents and media experiences and going out in nature as a child and all. Um, so that's, that's really great. And it's also nice again um, for people who have kids to think about alternate, you know, career paths that might be interesting to them. Um, so I want to th- say thank you for what you do because it's incredibly important and the service that you're providing to the world with all the education but it's beyond the public education component. It's this database and this data bank of critical information that's gonna help us save the world. Uh, One of the things we talk about, and I I was really happy you used the word optimistic earlier, um, because we talk about the sixth extinction and extinction and that we're in a very dire situation between climate change and the biodiversity crisis, but it's not hopeless. Right. So it's dire, but it's not hopeless. And all of this information and all of the incredibly passionate people like you are what is going to make make us survive through all of this. Yeah. And I think I, I really um, firmly believe that, that if you it's really important to imagine the future you want and work towards that future. And it's it's really I always say my goal is to help people think positively about the future, because those are the, going to be them, the change makers. Those will be the people that actually keep us from going into the ditch and help us find our way to the year 2100. And I, now I end by saying that um, 2100 sounds like a long time from now, but a kid born today is going to be 77 years old in the year 2100. So kids today will be citizens of the 22nd century. So it's not like this is a long time in the future thing. It's just, it applies to our own children and not just our grandchildren, but our own children. And I think that we are in a spot now where it's never been more important to inspire people to be thoughtful about the future and positive about the potential of the future. Yeah, that is great. And I that is a great way to wrap it up because I like to ask people about their legacy. And I now know a little bit about what you consider your uh, goals for your legacy to be. And so, Kirk, I really want to thank you for coming on the show and thank you for your work. And I want to say to our audience, thank you for listening. Um, it's really great to uh, have you here every month listening to Conservation Conversations. And um, of course, we're NatureServe at natureserve.org. And you can find out more about us there. And you can support our mission through donations or through adopting a species. And of course, Kirk, you can tell us the website for the Natural History Museum. We're just nmnh.org. nmnh.org. That's perfect. And uh, please go visit the museum. There's The Triceratops isn't out front anymore, but uh, it's still an awesome place to go and visit, whether you're an adult or a child or childlike adult.